Morning, Mike. Um, well, afternoon where you are. <laughs> Thanks for coming on to uh, the Teacher's Point of View podcast. I mean, what a pleasure to have you. I know you've had quite a remarkable journey. Obviously, you've gone sort of you were born and raised in South Africa and um, went over to Singapore to teach. And you've been there since you moved up the rankings, gone to deputy principal. And um, you've had quite a remarkable journey until this point. I mean, I'm going to stop like bigging you up. I mean, can you can you start off by telling everyone a little bit about you and that's like, sort of your journey so far? Well, thanks, TJ. It's great to be here. Um, I think you're setting me up. Uh, I hope I can uh, back up what you're saying, but uh, no, it's it's a real privilege to be here with you and, you know, just take some time out of the day to talk about education, something I'm passionate about. I know something you're passionate about and um, really a, an area of life that impacts so many people around the world, whether it's directly or indirectly. So um, it's really cool. Thanks for having me on the podcast. As you mentioned, uh, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa originally, um, and that's where I grew up. Um, and then came to Singapore nine years ago. We, uh, we thought we'd, my wife and I, we felt like we needed to travel a bit and see the world. Uh, we felt we were a little bit bogged down in what we were doing in South Africa. And so coming to Singapore, we'd never been here before. So it was a real adventure for us. And uh, we were so fortunate with the positions we, we got and, and obviously being able to grow with some of the organizations that I've been working with. So it's, um, yeah, it's been a real privilege. We love Singapore. It's definitely our home now. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, the, the education climate here. Um, and it's really exciting. I think the education climate around the world is exciting, even though it's an incredibly challenging period right now that we're going through. Uh, I think we're still going to go through some challenges for the next 12, 18 months possibly. But then I think the future is very bright and I'm very optimistic about what it's going to look like for schools. I think we've been forced in many ways through this COVID experience to rethink ourselves um, and to really think, you know, what is a priority or what does school look like and how do we set kids up for the future? So anyway, I look forward to discussing those things, but um, maybe let me tell you how about I got into education first. You know, when I was at school, I didn't, uh, you know, have a fantastic childhood, although I was very fortunate compared to many of the other South Africans. Uh, but there were definitely some challenges in my family, uh, and that led to me being fairly disengaged while at school um, and, and really feeling quite hopeless when it came to things of academics. And, and I really just didn't care, to be quite honest. Um, but I had one teacher in particular uh, who really took an interest in me and motivated me, encouraged me, and inspired me to, uh, to work hard and achieve my dreams. And, uh, and this teacher was a real role model in my life and um, had such a significant impact on me and, and definitely laid a foundation in my life for the success that I've achieved. Um, and I knew there and then that I wanted to do that, that same level of motivation um, for other people, you know, students, adults, whoever it is around the world. And that really stuck with me. And to this day, I remember that so clearly. So that really got me on the path of education. And, uh, and I think at that point, I knew, okay, this is, this is more of a calling than a job, right? And I knew it's something I was called to and, uh, and something I'm absolutely passionate about. So I always love telling that story because it's, uh, if you knew me at high school, and, and uh, obviously I've been so fortunate to be in the position I am now, but um, it, it's it's only because people invested in my life and I want to do the same to others. So thanks for having me on here, man. Yeah, awesome. I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that because when I was like 15, 16, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do. I mean, when I was 16, I had my first girlfriend and I mean, that was my priority at that point. And uh, I remember just like not really paying massive amounts of attention to school. It was just kind of, I mean, I've done okay in my GCSEs and then my A-levels. I mean, I didn't even like bother. And I went to university because all my friends were going and my parents said it was the right thing to do. And um, like, I mean, what, what do you think you do like for education as a teacher? Like, I mean, because it's, it's beyond just teaching teaching, isn't it? I mean, you're trying to set children up for life. Like, I mean, what, what is it for you that kind of gets you up in the bed in the morning and like, thinks, oh, this is how I'm going to make a difference today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's a dangerous place when, whenever anyone in any profession, you know, is just going through the motions. There has to be that passion that drives you. And, and of course, there's going to be times where things are challenging and you have to grit your teeth and just get through it. But ultimately, there has to be a passion that drives you. And I think for me, being able to see the influence I have on people's lives positively, whether it's students or staff members or the wider community associated with our school, um, that really inspires me. You know, that, that's, that lines up with my strengths uh, as a leader and really makes me come alive. I've got to be honest, sitting in a room, you know, standing in an auditorium, getting in a classroom with other students, people, that excites me. 
sitting behind a computer all day, that doesn't excite me, right? It's part of my job. I've got to do it. It's important. Um, but what gets me excited is the influence uh, and the interactions I can have with students. And I think something that's really encouraging, you know, education is a journey. Um, and so different to a, a typical sales process where you'd see the result almost immediately. Uh, with education, sometimes it takes years. Um, but it's so encouraging when we do see our students down the line, you know, going through high school into university, possibly starting their own business. You know, that, that's really inspiring because we can see the influence that we've had on them. Now, it takes many people to influence someone towards, you know, to achieve their goal. But if we can just have a small part in their journey, that's, that's our job done. I, I definitely believe that. Absolutely. Let, let's talk about like what teaching is like in Singapore, because obviously you've been there for nine years now. Um, like, did you, what, how did you find the difference in terms of teaching in South Africa to, to sort of transition into Singapore? Yeah, good question. So, look, I think in South Africa, you've got such a wide range of schools. Um, I, I was fortunate to work in a private school in South Africa. Uh, I went to a government school. Um, and, and obviously in South Africa, you have, you know, different offerings of schools pulls apart from our township schools that are incredibly under-resourced through to your affluent schools within the suburbs. So um, it's hard to define exactly what education looks like there, but I can speak about my experience. And so I definitely found that um, the school experience that I had in South Africa, it was, it was excellent. The school that I worked at, it was great. It was achieving good academic standards. Um, but the difference that I see coming to Singapore, where you have equally high academic standards, um, probably, a, probably uh, better resources um, to, to access and to use as an educator. But the difference I saw was really in the international mindedness, we call it, you know, in the perspective of the world. Um, being in Singapore, we're fortunate to be in a really multicultural society where, you know, we've got classrooms in our school where on average you'll have 10 or 11 different nationalities within a classroom. So think about the discussions that are taking place about world events, about mathematics, about literature. You know, you can imagine there's so many different perspectives and that really adds to a rich or creates a rich environment for the students. So, um, so that's, that's really unique here. And I think that's fairly similar in most international schools, but I think in Singapore particularly because it is such a melting pot of cultures and such an expat city. Um, in South Africa, you obviously don't have that because that's just not the culture there. So, you know, obviously it's a, people, it's a national system. People are focused on the national curriculum. Um, but I think one of the benefits of being in Singapore is really having that perspective of the world and being connected, right? We, we've got amazing, you know, examples of how we connect with schools around the world, share classrooms, uh, share resources. Um, so that's, that's very cool. And I think it exposes kids to something else. With that said, though, you know, in, in South Africa, the, um, there, there are many challenges when it comes to I mean, many things, but education in particular. And, you know, something I'm passionate about is seeing how education can be used really to, to solve the world's problems. Um, and I, I really believe it can. It's, it's the foundation point. And if we haven't got education right, we can forget about solving the rest of society's problems. Um, and I think in South Africa, we, we really are faced with that, where we have to, as a government, has to make some significant um, decisions um, about education because it doesn't seem to be going the direction that, that we all believe it needs to be going in. Sure. I mean, it's not, obviously, it's, I'm sure it's not just South Africa that people feel that about. I mean, like, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel like that about the way that the English education uh, profession is, is kind of moving. I mean, what, where do you think it's going wrong? Like, what, what direction do you think it needs to go in? And, and what, why is it not going in that direction? Well, yeah, it's a, that's a very good question. And I think if you look at the trend around the world, most state-run education systems actually fail. Um, you know, while they will have limited success, broadly, I think we can assess that they are financially unsustainable. Um, and, and in terms of academic results, across the board, they probably don't achieve as much as they want to achieve. So we've learned that the government struggles to run education. I think one thing that, you know, being in a private school context, one of our benefits is that we can, we're autonomous. We can make our decisions, we can run our budgets, we can run our school. And I believe, you know, we need to be empowering those schools. Sure, those state schools throughout the UK, South Africa, Australia, US, wherever it is, empower those schools to be able to run autonomously uh, and to trust the leaders in those schools, set them up for success, trust them, trust the educators. 
to, uh, to be able to implement an academic program that achieves success. Now, I can see why, obviously, you have, uh, you know, uh, academic standards uh, across a you know, national curriculum, because when you're operating at such scale, you know, it's hard to have all of these autonomous schools running. How do you ensure sustainability, consistency? I mean, there are a million questions. So I don't, for one minute, think that it's a, an easy task. I think it's an incredibly complex task. Um, but I would see the, the opportunity to give more authority in terms of making decisions to the school leaders, to the educators in the classroom. Um, and then really you, you're opening up the free market then because then parents should have an opportunity to choose which school they go to. And those schools that are more higher performing uh, will obviously have a greater enrollment. I suppose that creates another issue. Um, but yeah, in short, I would say we, we need to really empower people. You know, there's nothing worse than when we have a, a dictator as the Minister of Education or whoever it might be just barking down orders. Um, and then teachers who are, you know, working, you know, nine to five, seven to five, whatever it is, uh, flat out dealing with multiple issues in the classroom, doing a million compliance exercises. And then all of a sudden they got to jump and do these other things. So, um, so I, I think that's something uh, that needs to happen. I don't know how we do it, but I think if we move in that direction of empowering schools to lead themselves, we'll be heading in the right direction. And you know, even a slight shift towards that, I think will be a really welcome, uh, welcome change. I mean, you, you've raised some really good points there, and I think it's something that's come up a couple of times in in previous podcasts. But um, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's very important that education sector is run by, in, in some respects, educators. And I feel like the, one of the big problems that we have here in the UK at the moment is that we have an education secretary who's never been in a classroom barring when he was a, a student himself 30 years ago. Um, and then also we've got this big problem in the UK that ministers of education, they only last 18 to 24 months. Now, there's no real lifespan for education secretaries because it's almost looked like as as a stepping stone for politicians to get into something else. And um, I mean, there is this like, the, the problem is they don't know necessarily what's best for these schools like educators do, you know, like these educators have been in the classroom, they're, they're in it like five days a week, seven, I mean, 52 weeks in a year, well, 39 weeks in a year, but you, you they're, they're there, you know, like they're there every single day. And, um, and these education ministers don't necessarily know what, what's best for these kids. And you talk about kind of giving them freedom to like run their schools and trust, trust their schools. I mean, I think that's something that's quite apparent that they do in, in Australia. And it's not something that's done here. Like we have something called offset inspections. Um, and they, they, they obviously they go around for two days and then rate whether the school's good or not. But um, I think there's this big thing about kind of a lack of trust within the the teaching profession and 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 sort of the education ministers and you know like uh, that's a big problem and I think you're absolutely right like uh, I think the school leaders should be given more freedom like why do you think that's such an effective thing to do like why does that change the game? You know, it's look. Uh, let me just start off by saying again, you know, I think it is running an education system is incredibly complex and so I'm sure there are many other variables that these you know, leaders in government are, are juggling. So, so I can see it's being a challenge. I, I do also agree that, you know, having a, a minister of education leading a program who is not an educator is, uh, is not going to be able to see things through the eyes of an educator. You know, uh, even I have to remind myself, you know, when I'm making decisions in our school, I have to remind myself, okay, what is a nursery teacher thinking? Uh, what is a grade five teacher thinking? How is this impacting them on the ground? Think about the, the practicalities through the day, what they have to be getting done, you know, what's going to work. Um, and whenever we are, things are dictated to a school, um, let alone, you know, the different ages within a school, but then you've got different contexts. You've got city schools, you've got country schools, all of them have a different context. But we're trying to sort of get them to all achieve a certain standard across the board. Um, which is kind of opposite in what we're doing in the classroom, which is really trying to inspire individuality and, and the understanding that students will learn differently. But yet when we assess schools, we assess them all according to the same benchmark. So I think it's, it is a real challenge, but I think definitely what I've you know, seen, I think we have some incredibly uh, passionate, dedicated and competent educators around the world. I, you know, just in my small circle that I interact with, you have people not only who are passionate about the profession, but who are exceptionally skilled in leading a business, leading a school, balancing a budget, making a profit, you know, ensuring high academic results. Um, so why, why don't we empower these people? 
to be able to make decisions at their levels um, and take away the bureaucracy and the red tape from the top and the government. So that's one thing that, that I really think can work. I think the challenge also, and you hit the nail on the head, TJ, was, you know, there seems to be this revolving door in the Office of Education, right? So now someone, they never last too long and probably because the expectations are not set up correctly. So they're either not meeting the expectations because they're unattainable or there's some other issues that have gone on or they, like you said, they've been promoted to a different you know, position in the cabinet. Um, but the problem with education is it doesn't change overnight. So it, what we implement today, we might only see the results of in two, three, four years time and the greater impact in five to 10 years time. So it's not an immediate uh, result that we achieve, but unfortunately when it comes to government KPIs or expectations, uh, you know, in more than just government, we, we wanting that immediate resolution. So that's a real challenge as well. You know, we have to select a course of action that we're going to follow. And then regardless of who's in power, we've got to stick with it because you all believe that this is the way that education should be run. Um, you know, I suppose, uh, a deeper challenge or issue if you uh, dig down a little bit deeper would be looking at you know china versus the us right now if we just had a look at it and i'll leave my political opinions aside but if we look at the us democracy which will really yo-yo from one side to the next right whereas if you look at the chinese government which has been in power and we can talk about some of the challenges around that but, but they are in power and they're steadfast and they know where they're going. And they sort of don't seem to have that yo-yoing effect back and forwards. I think Singapore has been fortunate that way as well, in that there's been one, largely one political party in, in charge. And, and people have disputed that and have issues with that. But in reality, we're able to achieve so much more than if we are yo-yoing from side to side. So that's another little political thing on the side. But I definitely think there's some value in that and, uh, and be able to set the course and then stay the course um, and then see the benefit of that year on year as we go. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, I think you raised some really good points there. And, and ultimately, it's true. Uh, like when, when government come into power, they have four years to fix the country, which never happens. Right. But they, they, they make these plans and, um, they, and they expect it to reach a certain milestone by, within, within four years. But if an education sector has only got two years, I mean, how can the government expect them to hit their targets uh, when they don't hit their targets within four years? Which, which is again remarkable. And you, I think you're right. I think more autonomy needs to be needs to be given to school leaders so they can run their schools and, and see what's best for them because well, best for their kids rather because ultimately that's what's important isn't it like it's about finding that niche that that the student is good at and kind of helping them excel and one of the things that we just kind of mentioned was that the, the whole approach to education how we assess children is generalized and you're talking about kids that are in rural city uh, sorry rural areas compared to inner cities that they're sort of compared that like in terms of their grade and these people now have to go apply for the same jobs and you know like it's complete different and but at the same time, they are going to be applying for these jobs. So how do you differentiate which candidate is going to be better for the job if you don't assess them with the same grades, you know? I mean, what, what's the answer there? It's a real good question. So I think you, you can do both. Um, you know, if, we, if I speak about our school, uh, and we're not a perfect school by any means, um, you know, we want to identify the individual strengths of every child and be able to work to extend or support every child according to where they are and how they learn. But that doesn't mean that we can't do standardized testing. And we do. We do external standardized testing twice a year because that gives us a benchmark on average where our students are at. And you have to have that. You know, we can't compare, you know, apples and oranges, right? We have to have some level of benchmark. But if that's the only measure of, of uh, academic progress that we're using, then that that's becomes the issue. Because then we define that child as largely unsuccessful or, um, you know, not achieving, you know, grade level uh, academic um, standards, um, but yet that child might be exceptionally creative and, and strong in certain other areas. Um, and so we, we limit kids in one way. So I think having a balance between external benchmarks that are standardized and then also internal more formative assessment data to be able to really identify where that student is. And then as they go through, you know, through life and in, into careers, their strengths will ultimately determine what jobs they, they sign up for, right? So, so not everyone's going to be the accountant or the doctor or whatever, um, but there'll be more opportunities that will come out. 
So that's one thing. And I think also moving forward, as you look to setting kids up for success in the future, we have to identify that it's not only academic success that is going to set kids up for success. Um, we have to look at all of those transdisciplinary, transferable skills that we know are going to set students up for the future. Um, you know, it's talked about often that the future's, you know, going to be changing rapidly, and it is, and, and there are going to be many new jobs in the future, just like the jobs today that weren't here 10, 15 years ago. So how do we set kids up for that success? Um, and yes, you know, academics is one component. But a larger component is going to be transferable skills that they can use regardless of the industry that they're going to be in. Um, and we know now that they're going to need communication skills, social skills, collaboration skills, research skills, whatever it might be. Um, so honing in on those things as well, which are slightly harder to measure according to like, you know, a standardized assessment, but in reinforcing those uh, skills together with the academics. For sure. I think one, one thing that... Um I was quite taken back by, I don't know if you know Gavin McCormack, but obviously he was on my podcast actually out tonight, by the way. Um, but he's, uh, he, 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 was, he said like one of the ways that they assess their students is um, instead of them doing a test at the end of the year, they, um, some of them are asked to do a presentation to, to Gavin. And, and the reason why he gets them to do that is because he assess like, um, yes, they might know the knowledge, but are they making eye contact with him in an interview? Are they like presenting well? Are they speaking clearly, you know, and they he can actually try to help them on an, individ on an individual basis because I think that's one of the problems here in the UK. I think it's very much exam-based um, assessment and there's not enough real life interpersonal skills sometimes. I mean, somebody that's got a first class honours degree doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a better like a salesperson or a customer service rep or, you know, um, and, and it just, it, like, it's about kind of giving them initiative. And I think, you know what, so in some respects, like with everything that's happening with social media and um, the way that it's moving in the direction it's moving, I think some kids are now so reliant on social media that they lack a little bit of initiative. Um, and I've seen it in my nephew and nieces, you know, sometimes um, they're, they're so bright, but when it comes to like using their brain, like, I mean, you tell them what to do, but there's no like, they do exactly what they're told, but nothing more, you know, there's no initiative there. And um, I feel like that's kind of being sucked out of kids a little bit nowadays. I mean, like, are you implementing anything, anything to, to make sure that you are getting the best out of your kids, not just academically, but in terms of interpersonal skills and, and like just setting them up for life? Yeah, it, it's yeah, absolutely. Are. I mean, I think all schools need to be focused on that. If you think about why schools, you know, have leveraged academic results in the past as the only assessment is because it's easy to manage. You can manage the data very clearly. It's black and white and you can assess your school based on academic performance. So a government can then look at all of the high performing schools, the low performing schools, and then look to address those academically. So so that's the model that's coming out of, and, and there's, there's um, you know, that, that works if, if that's all you're trying to assess. Um, but I think everyone's learning now that that is one dimensional, and, and that's not gonna determine every child's level of success. <clears throat> um, so balancing the transferable skills that I spoke about before is so critical, and being intentional about teaching those. Now, you're always gonna have content, right? So there's a, there's a big debate between content versus skills. You have to have content because the content is what you learn, but the skills is how you learn. Um, and so definitely within an international school context, these are really prioritized. Um, largely because we don't have to comply to a government body that is really stipulating our curriculum. Uh, we have a level of autonomy to create our own curriculum and to include uh, these components within our curriculum. Obviously, we go through accreditation processes and, and all of that in terms of standards. Um, but we have to be intentional about teaching them. Um, and I think if we're intentional about teaching them, if we put it on the report card, if we're talking to parents about it, then it becomes part of our daily life, part of our teaching and learning, part of what we do, rather than just saying, okay, we're teaching mathematics now, then we're teaching language, and then, you know, oh, by the way, we're going to just sort of have five minutes to tell you how to research in the library. You know, it's got to be integrated into everything we do. Um, and that really is going to set kids up for success in the future. So, you know, as you're mentioning that, uh, Gavin, looking at all of those softer skills, what people traditionally call it, um, those are going to become more and more of a priority for us. I mean, if you think about when you and I went to school, you know, we didn't have any of that. We, it was just, you know, content driven exams determined if you pass or fail. But even in that, if we look back now, there were presentations that you do, there's you know, group projects that you do, 
So there's elements of skills that you are learning, even without knowing it. So schools are doing the stuff anyway, but it's just about prioritizing it. And then when we are aware, okay, these are the skills we're actually teaching by learning about World War II or whatever it might be. Then we can say, okay, well, let's be even more intentional and strategic about how we include these skills into everything that we do. How are we incorporating this from grade one through to grade five through to grade 12? Is there a continuum that works through so that by the time the kids leave our school, we know that they've covered all of these skills and we've done everything possible to set them up for success. So, so that's a big thing that we, we definitely have to be focused on. And I would um, really challenge any educators out there listening to this. If their teaching practice day in, day out is solely focused on content um, and standardized assessment, then we really got to question ourselves and, and reflect and think, right, well, are we really setting these students up for success? W what are we setting them up for? What positions are they going to go into in the future? What's it going to look like for them? And, um, and it's, it's definitely not a, a cut and dry answer because I think a lot of this relates to different contexts um, and different countries that we find ourselves in. But if we can find what that is for me here in Singapore, for our students that are coming from around the world, you know, for yourself in the UK or Australia, or US or India, wherever it might be, that's the key. And, uh, and I suppose to make that happen, you need a bit of autonomy as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and it, I mean, how important do you think having autonomy is to to giving your kids the best chance at success post school? I think it's critical um, because a, a school will not. I mean, any individual, you know, progress equals contentment or happiness, right? So if you are progressing, you're growing, you're developing, you're going to be happy. So if you think about a school, if school leaders and teachers are just being told what to do, there's no you know, chance of progress. They're just sort of clocking in, clocking out, doing a job. Where's the inspiration in the classroom coming from, you know? But if we can empower schools to be autonomous, to run themselves with a level of accreditation, there has to be that, um, you're gonna see way more progress, way more engagement and motivation because people have a hand in, in actually creating something. You know, when, when I started uh, at Gems World Academy, we were only seven years old and I joined in the second year, the start of the second year. Um, and our school was 134 students uh, on year one, and then we're just under 1,100 students now. So we had a significant growth, and being able to be part of that growth um, was really cool. And, and myself and all the other educators really felt part of actually building something quite significant here in Singapore and yeah. having an impact within our community, impacting these students. And there have been a ton of challenges along the way, and there are probably a ton of challenges we're still going to face. But it's, it's really cool when you're able to own something. And I think that's the key. If we can get the, the staff, the teachers, the leaders to own their school and not simply comply to someone above them dictating, then we're going to see more uh, impact in the classroom. Look, the same is true with kids and their learning, right? Um, if you, we've seen it when we revised our homework policy. So we include students as co-constructors in our homework. Um, and, and that's when we do homework, which is only upper primary. We don't do anything below that. Um, but the students are part of creating those assessments and they have an ownership in terms of what they want to do uh, and a voice in terms of that. And so the, we've seen the engagement level is significantly higher. Whereas when the teacher's just barking the orders down, you have to do this and this. You might get it done, but you're not going to do it well because you're just getting it done before you can go outside and play cricket or soccer or whatever it is. So there has to be a level of ownership, agency is the word, the buzzword that's thrown around or, or voice um, in everything from our students to our educators as well. I agree. I, you know, like your teachers get into teaching to make a difference, don't they? Like they, they, they want to make an impact and, and help the future generation. Ultimately, that's that should be the reason why they get into teaching. Don't get me wrong. I know it's not the same for everyone, but majority of teachers that I speak to that are passionate about what they want to do, they want to make a difference to kids. And um, it's almost like, well, hey, have some freedom and, and go do what you want to do and make a difference to these kids. Like, I guess you, you should have some like sort of guideline, but it's almost like it should be a spine where you build the body around it, you know, because you want to make that difference. You're naturally enthusiastic and passionate about doing it. Whereas like people that are controlling it, like say the education minister or the government, they're not passionate about education. They're, they're, they're passionate about politics, you know? Um, so it, I, I absolutely agree. I think there needs to be more trust given to the profession to get on and, and crack on with what, what they do best and what their, special, like what their specialty is, you know? Um, you talk about the challenges that you faced and um, the, the challenges that are coming up. Let's talk about the biggest challenge that you've fought, uh, faced so far, and that's been COVID. I mean, how difficult has it been this year? 
Yeah, it's been incredibly tough. Uh, I think I speak for all teachers around the world to say that um, it, it's been a real, real challenge. Um, and I say that we're in a very fortunate position. We're in a, a well-resourced school <clears throat> in a very affluent city, a city that's done very well in managing COVID. Um, so I can only imagine that for other educators out there, it's been even more challenging. Um, if I speak to some of my friends in education in South Africa, same thing. It, it's, it's absolutely um, chaos at times. So for us, it was a real challenge. Um, we obviously closed our school, the government closed our schools, all schools, we went, we went into a full lockdown. Um, and we transitioned very quickly to an online learning model. Now the problem we had is we didn't have an online learning platform. So uh, you tried running a school on, uh, on Google Docs and Google Meets and, uh, and we had a seesaw platform which was very helpful. But it was incredibly challenging. So, you know, you're managing obviously your own personal emotions, the emotions of your staff who naturally, you know, a little bit on edge because there's a pandemic around the world, right? And, and most of our teachers are from all over the world. Uh, so we've got family members back in the UK or US, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, uh, China, Japan, all over. So, you know, the, you manage that as well. And then we place the expectations of working from home. So now you're going to work from home on a platform which isn't really designed to be run as an education platform. You've never been trained to do this and you've got your own kids at home and now we're asking you to achieve the same levels of success that we had before. And so we quickly realized that as, as leaders, we had to obviously you know, quickly get a system in place uh, in terms of a timetable or a structure and then we need to get out of teacher's way. We need to just support them get them what they need and, and, and really just get out their way and let them teach. Uh, the first few weeks, naturally, we had to make a lot of changes, right? Because we learned things. There was new directives from the government. We could do some things. We couldn't do other things. Um, but we, yeah, so we, we made a lot of changes. But then after that, we said, right, you know what? We're not making any more changes. This is it. And we're just going to stick with this and give our teachers a little bit of sanity to actually say, okay, I can actually plan my week now. I know what's coming ahead. There's not these curveballs flying in from all over. So that was a real challenge. Look, and that, that probably lasted maybe eight to 10 weeks, I would imagine. Um, and then we were able to come back onto campus to finish off our academic year just for three weeks, but we'd had 50% of the students on off. Um, the students couldn't leave the classroom basically. Then we had our big summer break and we came back and in August we were able to open our school. Uh, but also with significant restrictions in place. Students couldn't leave the classroom. They had to sit in exam style rows. You know, uh, it was just not school as we know it, right? But, but we were grateful we could return to school. So that was a real challenge. And then thankfully, as we've moved along and as Singapore has obviously done better with um, this, you know, managing COVID, we've been able to ease some of the restrictions. We still do follow all of the, you know, the restrictions that we have. Um, but they've been released, uh, sorry, relaxed a little bit as we've moved on. So, so we're very grateful for the progress Singapore's made. But I'm, I'm sympathetic for you know, teachers in the UK, uh, in the US as well, uh, all over the world who are back into lockdown. Australia went through it as well, you know, came out of lockdown, you know, had a little bit of school back into lockdown. It's incredibly hard. And I think we have to realize that um, like many professions, I mean, there's expectations and pressures on people, but I think definitely in education as well, if you get a class of 25 students and you're responsible for their, their growth and education, right? There's an emotional um, weight that comes with that. And so teachers are carrying that, but yet now we're asking them to do their job largely without the skills or resources required to do their job. Um, let alone their own, you know, well-being, you know, pressures and, and, and emotional challenges that they're going through personally. So it's incredibly hard. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, I don't see globally, I don't see a end just yet. <clears throat> I think we might struggle for at least the rest of this academic year and possibly into the next. But then after that, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic and positive that, um, that we will, I don't think we'll go back to what we knew before. I think we'll go back to something better. I think uh, as a world, as education, we've learned a lot about this. I think we've learned as well, there's, uh, there's a need for blended learning environment, especially in high school. Um, the, we, we've learned a lot through this, I definitely have. And I think we're gonna be able to implement some even better strategies um, and approaches to learning in the future. Um, and I think we also realize that the world is changing and, and perhaps some schools 
we're, we're very set in our ways before COVID. And we always spoke about yeah, the other need for these skills and teaching skills and things and being less reliant on pure content. Well, COVID's forced us to do that. Um, and maybe that's actually the little nudge that we needed as an industry to keep progressing and to keep moving. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, it's, it's quite remarkable you say that. And um, obviously there's a couple of points that I want to touch base on, but obviously the, f the first being, um, yeah, I mean, ed educators across the world. I mean, they, they've literally had to be innovative this year, had to adapt. They had to literally transfer everything online, transfer back into the classroom, do both at times. And um, you're talking about, uh, I, I don't know how it is across the world, but in the UK, there's been another lo national lockdown, but uh, teachers are still having to go into school and teach, um, whereas all the other professions are at home at the moment. And um, and teachers, uh, and you know, it's it's and we talk about this vaccine coming out and the government have sort of published who's priority to get it and you talk about doctors and elderly but there's nothing to do with teachers at the moment like teachers aren't even put on that list and you talk about you're putting yourselves at risk every single day um there's certain teachers i've spoken to that are above a certain age and that are vulnerable and they're still going in because like you said you've got this moral obligation almost as a teacher because you don't want to let your kids down like you want to help them succeed but you've got so much pressure on you you've got to make sure that you're you're adhering to the law to the to safeguarding to make sure that the kids are safe but also to meet curriculum needs like it's you've obviously got these standardized testing that is going to come up at the end of the year and you've got to get these kids prepared for that you know um i mean you're in the private sector so like your you obviously you most of your parents will probably be from affluent backgrounds and you've probably got a lot of pressure from from them them saying that well we don't want our kids to fall behind you know this is what we're paying you for i mean did you find those challenges come up with with parents yeah um, massive challenges like that you, you know i think uh, if we think about the, the parents expectation as well and uh, as a private school one of the questions we've had is why should we keep paying if our kids are sitting at home you know and and getting a, a much less of a service than they would be if they're on campus now you're running an organization the costs are still there so that was a tough conversation that we had to have with parents and, and you know, we did make some concessions, but um, the, you can see the parents are, they're well entitled to ask that question, you know, hey, I'm, I'm paying for the service. I'm not really getting it now. Why should I keep paying these exorbitant fees? So, um, so that was yeah, a real challenge. You know, one of the things that teaching is, is that you, you interface with your customer, right, every day. Um, whereas certain other professions, you're able to work remotely and then interface with your customer as and when you need to, or it's, it's actually more practical on Zoom and you can really get by. Um, particularly teaching lower primary and early years, you know, it's, it's incredibly hard to replicate that classroom in an online environment because, you, you know, kids' attention span is fairly short. You need to engage them. Uh, and then we all know, you know, kids are faced, you know, with screen time for a whole day. That's not really going to set them up for success and help them. So there are many challenges. And look, we went through all of that. We had some staff members who were elderly and we, we gave them the option to, you know, just to remain at home when we came back uh, for that short little period before the end of our academic year last year. Um, so we did what we can, but I agree with you. I think we need to definitely um, elevate the role of the teacher in society. Um, and, and, and acknowledge the work that teachers are doing, um, that it really is the front lines. You know, if we look at some of these other countries, like UK definitely for, sh for sure, where cases are increasing, um, you, you are putting yourself at risk by, by going to school. And it's really your passion that keeps you there, but also you got a job to do, right? And there really isn't another option for you. You can't decide to work from home that day because you can have 20 kids sitting in a classroom waiting for you. So in one way, teachers' hands are tied. Um, but I think something that we can do is just acknowledge the effort um, and the work that is going in. I don't have a solution to how we would change it, but I think, yeah, just encouraging the teachers to know that their job is valued just as much as, as you said, the NHS is, um, that, that would go a long way. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. Again, this is why I've created this podcast in some respects is to create awareness for all the hard work teachers are doing. And um, they are. They're doing a remarkable job. And I feel like it is massively undervalued and underappreciated, this profession. And it, it's it's phenomenal. Like, genuinely, teachers are heroes at the moment. And I absolutely want to make that clear. Like, again, this is why we create this podcast is to let teachers know that they're not alone in the way that they're feeling. And again, like you go into teaching to want to make a difference. And right now, teachers are making a big, the biggest difference they've ever made, you know, um, and 
and I know it sounds silly because they might be falling behind the curriculum needs and expectations or even parents might be coming down at them or they might not feel supported from the government but they're making a kids like, so much different to these kids lives and I've spoken to head teachers for, uh, that are from schools in really deprived areas in the UK and you talk about some of these kids not having hot meals and they have one hot meal a day which is at school that which is at the school they go to and we're in a first world country and that still happens. Um, and you think about if they were to go for a four week lockdown, they probably wouldn't have made it, you know? And these teachers, like doctors, are, yeah, they save lives, but some of these teachers have saved so many lives over, over this period, over this year. And um, it's absolutely remarkable what teachers are doing. I mean, like what, what do you think that the, like the, the government in Singapore have done really well to support schools over this period? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get to now, but just a point you, you touched on there about the students come to school really to receive a hot meal. You know, that was something that in South Africa is, um, was really a challenge when schools closed down because most of the students, especially in our township schools, they will receive a meal at school. And for many of them, that's the only meal they'll have the whole day. So you take that away, um, it was a significant, significant challenge. And I, I don't think we can ever underestimate those practical, fundamental challenges. That, um, that people experience during those lockdown periods, and it's not over yet. So look, in Singapore, um, like I said, you know, we're very fortunate because Singapore has done well um, in terms of containing the virus. Singapore is an amazing city. I mean, it's, it's, it's very well resourced. I think it's very well run. But um, I, we, we receive very clear uh, directives from the Ministry of Education. Even though as a private school, we fall slightly out of the Ministry of Education, we're still under the umbrella. So very clear communication as to what the expectations are, what we can or what we can't do. And, uh, and being in true Singapore style, you know, it's not negotiable. You, th this is how we're doing it and everyone's doing it this way. Um, and I think largely that is, is why we've been successful here because people have just had to comply. Uh, as much as we might have disagreed with things at times, uh, that's just the way it is. But in hindsight now, I think it's been, we've been very fortunate. So I think uh, clear directives um, from, from the top, um, you know, right from the outset, the Singapore government was very clear in terms of their approach to managing this crisis and also communicated regularly so that people knew where they stood, what they can do, what they can't do. Um, and I think Singapore has had a very conservative approach to managing this, which once again, in hindsight has been positive because there's been, I think, two weeks today of no community cases. So they seem to have, have been able to control it. Um, and I think in time, they will slowly begin to release those restrictions. Um, as an independent school, we obviously, you know, are part of GEMS Education. So we receive directives from GEMS Education. Uh, we're an IB World School as well. So that's more from a curriculum perspective, but we will try and modify our curriculum from that perspective. So it's not like we are receiving a mandate from the Ministry of Education. And that's all we have to follow. We have a level of autonomy with you know, what we can do, how do we go online, all of those practical things we have the power to control when it comes to how many people can be in a room, can we access our campus, that's obviously mandated by the government. Um, but I think even in the, the local school setting in Singapore, I think largely they've coped very well. They've got the resources, they had the, the online learning platform, which, which um, was really beneficial. So they could transition to home learning a lot easier than some schools that didn't. Um, so Singapore is in a fortunate position, um, but they've also been very good and very clear in terms of managing it. And we've definitely felt that as a school that, you know, we know at all times what's going on and what's happening. It's, it's not a guessing game. Yeah, I think it's been that's been a big problem in the UK actually because a lot of the time schools don't find out what's going what's going to happen until the public find out. So you literally they like the, the, there's been times where the government say we're going into a lockdown tomorrow, and like the gov and, and schools have had to overnight come up with new like plans to to make sure that they fit the legislation and, and follow the the government guidelines to make sure that the kids are safe. And you took and the thing, the problem that we've had here is that. The government have changed their minds so many times about what's what's right. I mean, they they've said that children weren't going to pass it on, and then they turned out that they were going to be passers. And they said that not to wear masks at the beginning of September in the new academic year. And within three weeks, it was mandatory to wear masks. You know, and I mean, it's changed so much. And I think there's a lot of frustration. But ultimately, you know, it's unfortunate because 
it doesn't that's again you don't go into education because you want support from the government you do it to make a difference don't you and it's it's so hard to kind of remember that especially when like you're not you don't feel supported you know and and that's the thing i think as a, as a global community in the teaching profession almost just need to come together and just say you know like we're, we're here for you i mean you've had a really difficult year and but we're, we're here for you and you're not alone you know um what, what i mean what do you think the future of education looks like yeah, that's a, a great question. It's a big question as well, because I think it's so determined on the context that each school finds itself in. Um, I, I definitely see, you know, schools needing to transition away from purely, you know, um, academic based instruction. I think there has to be a transferable skills uh, intentionality within our schools to teach. Um, so I definitely see that from a curriculum perspective, that that's a way that we have to move towards if, if we haven't done it yet, COVID's forcing us to focus on that and actually to realize the world's changed. So I think that's, um, yeah, a, a definitely a way we're going. I, I see um, the rise of many more uh, low cost or mid market private schools, to be honest, uh, coming into the market. I've seen it in South Africa. I've seen it here in Singapore. I'm not too sure in the UK, but I'm sure it'll be coming there as well, if not already. Um, because I think people who have the opportunity um, to be able to afford not a premium school, but a mid-market school, maybe slightly more expensive than a typical government school if you pay for government fees, um, I, I think people would want that because they would want that level of autonomy. Um, and I see state-run education systems continuing to struggle, unfortunately, um, and, and sort of continue in the, the challenges that they find themselves in. But a new sort of class of, of mid-market, mid-tier schools that offer really a, a high class, uh, high standard of education uh, within a private setting. Um, I can see that doing very well. And I think we're already seeing that around the world. I think parents are, are going to have more choice as well, you know, certainly not all parents. Some parents are, you know, forced to make a decision and, and that's just, they have to go to a certain school based on their resources that they have at hand or where they live or whatever it might be. But more and more, I do think parents will have more of a choice about where they send their students, um, sorry, their children. So we've seen that in Singapore, you know, where when I came nine years ago, uh, as an expat city, you know, we had many international schools, you know, three, 4,000 students in a school, you know, really popular waiting lists. Um, but now, you know, things have changed dramatically. And even before COVID, you know, we would see nine years ago, 80% of our students' tuition was paid for by companies because um, their parents were on expat packages and that included the tuition. Now, about 20% of our students are in that um, space where their parents' companies will pay for their tuition. 80% uh, of our parents pay out of their own pocket. And so they're going to ask the question, right, well, I can pay this fee at your school or I can go down the road to that school. It's not as flashy, uh, but hey, I'm going to get a great teacher in the classroom and it's going to be half the price. So uh, it's definitely become more competitive within the Singapore context for, for private schools. So look, I think it's, you know, we often joke and say education is probably one of the least innovative industries in the world. You know, we teach innovation to our students, but how often have we actually innovated in terms of our organizational structures and what we do? And, and I think there's, there's validity to that statement. But I think COVID has forced us to really reflect upon ourselves, reflect upon the industry and really see where we're going in the future. Um, and I think there are going to be some shifts happening, but look, I, I see a, a real rebound coming after COVID. I think people get back into schools that, the, the, you know, when we get the opportunity to really engage with our teaching and learning, I think, I, I think a lot of good is going to come out of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, just to um, just kind of touch on what you said, I think one of the big problems here in the UK is there are a lot of people from the private parts of the UK and, and like myself, I mean, if, 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 the, the option was to go to a really rubbish school or to go a mid-range um, private school. I don't think my parents would have been able to afford to go to the mid-range private school. So I would have had to go to the rubbish school, right? But and, but the problem is there's going to be a lot of people in the UK that would have the similar problem, you know? And um, I mean, the, the big problem here is like if, if that does happen, the, the gap between the advantage and disadvantage only gets bigger. I mean, COVID has only highlighted that. And what we end up doing by moving to a system like that is having a massive gap between the advantage and disadvantage. And we talk about kids having free meals, like just to survive. Um, I mean, you, you're giving some of these kids no chance if they can't get into private schools, if we did move into that, into that way. I mean, like if you think obviously that's the way it's going, but 
for, for, for some of these kids, for some families, I mean, it's going to be detrimental. Like you're never going to get out of their poverty um, trap, you know, and is yeah. there no other way? Like, I mean, are, are, is it not better just state schools give, give, be given more autonomy just to kind of help run their schools opposed to just going down the private sector route? Look, I, I think absolutely. And, and there will always be a need for, you know, low cost schools or, or, or schools within that sector to provide a free education or whatever it might be for students. And I agree with you. The key is to be able to raise that standard of education when you haven't got the revenue coming in. So that's, I think, why we haven't seen those schools privatized, whereas you've got your mid-market and, and affluent schools privatized because there's, it's money making, right? Um, so I, I think privatizing the whole education sector is, you know, could be phenomenal, if, uh, but I don't think governments would be willing to do that. Um, but I think there would still be opportunities within, um, within the education systems to do a, a level of autonomy, to provide a level of autonomy to those schools. I mean, think about it, and, and there's many examples. I can speak about an example in South Africa where uh, principals from, or head teachers from, uh, retired principals from, you know, affluent schools within the suburbs of Cape Town, Johannesburg, they are mentoring head teachers and principals in township schools uh, because there's a skills gap. And so, you know, that township head teacher they, they are passionate, they're committed, they, they're doing everything they want, but they've never run a school of 2,000 students. They've never balanced a budget. They have never you know, hired great teachers. So there's, there's inspirational stories like that that I know are happening on the ground right now in South Africa that are providing hope, that are uplifting those schools. And actually some of the data coming out of those schools who are part of that program, um, their student academic data is phenomenal because it just shows the impact of a leader. When there's a good leader in place, um, the staff function. If the staff are functioning, the students are going to have the best experience. So it, it's all about our priorities. Um, that, that's a private, you know, organization, nonprofit organization that's stepping in. Sadly, the government hasn't done it. Um, but I think if we can do programs like that, we can identify the gaps and then start to uplift some of those poorer schools so that they can still offer a high quality education to all students, right? Because that's what we want, right? There's no point, as you said, you know, things becoming privatized. And I think that is going to happen, you know, in the mid-tier and up, um, upper tier schools. But then there's this massive, you know, gap at the bottom, probably with the most students in it. Um, and then the gap between the have and the have nots just continues to, to grow. So I think there are opportunities. Um, I haven't seen anything from a government level, unfortunately, but maybe there's a lot out there. Um, but I've seen NGOs doing similar things to try and address those, some of those challenges. Absolutely. The thing is, though, like you get into education to, to really make a difference to kids. And the kids that need the most difference being made to them are the ones that are from the deprived areas, unfortunately, aren't they? Um, like they're, they're given that much more of a difficult stepping stone to try and get into like a successful yeah. career. You know, uh, I mean, you, you have to have something about you. I mean, a lot of the time, if you're privileged, if you know, you tend to know somebody and you tend to be given like opportunities. Whereas the disadvantaged kids tend to not, not, not know anyone. And then they kind of have a disadvantage like learning period like throughout their school. And then they go up against people that already know people like CEOs within the company like for, when they apply for jobs. I mean, I mean the, the whole point of education is to give every, every child an opportunity to succeed in life. You know, it's like Gabby McCormack said, it, it's about finding the kid's niche and really setting them up. And it, I mean, uh, it's obviously I've come from uh, not a massively privileged background. So for me, it, like, I'd want to see like a massive difference being made to, to these kids. And unfortunately in the nicest way possible, I wouldn't want it to be privatized because I would want as, as, as many kids as possible to go and, and have an opportunity to succeed. Um, but you're right. I think I think the key of it is giving giving trust and autonomy to the school leaders and and letting them crack on and, and do what they what they are best at doing and what they're passionate about. I mean, in your opinion, we'll finish it here because I, I know you're kind of running out of time. But what do you think school leaders need to do to step up? I mean, what what makes a good school leader for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Just to you know follow on what you were saying earlier, you know, but giving autonomy to those school leaders who are in those deprived areas um, will really change the thing, you know, significantly because those school leaders and teachers in those deprived areas are the true heroes because they are working in the most challenging circumstances with the least resources, um, you, you know, and they still day in day out, they're going to their jobs, they're getting it done, you know, so just think about it. If you've got that level of skill and passion 
that they're doing now. Imagine if we just give them the autonomy to actually run their school and make decisions. I, I think that alone is the key to shifting them from you know, poor to average, you know, and then average to good to great, that's a different story, but let's just move them to that. So, so I think that's, that's a definitely a step in the right direction. Um, what I think are key attributes for leaders, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about the role of relationships uh, in defining organizational culture. I think we can't expect high academic standards um, if we haven't got our school culture right. Um, you know, because, you know, the research shows us that the impact of a teacher and the positive relationship that a teacher has with a child is one of the most uh, biggest contributing factors to a child's academic success. Um, so we know that that works, right? But how are we going to get the teachers to be able to invest in the students and build a good connection with the students if they aren't feeling inspired, if they aren't feeling connected? So as a school leader, our priority is to make sure that we have an environment where, where teachers can collaborate with one another, when they can feel supported, they can challenge each other as well, um, and, and really look forward to coming to work because we know without a shadow of a doubt that's going to translate to the teaching and learning in the classroom. So I think for me personally, that's my, my, always my priority. You, you know, you mentioned the book that I wrote, but it's prioritizing relationships in the workplace, intentionally prioritizing them um, so that we, we really create this positive in work environment that everyone wants to be part of. Absolutely. Just on that book, it's about building rapport, isn't it? Um, and, and it's obviously it's something you're quite passionate about and, and building rapport and connecting with kids and getting them to feel that like that you care about them. And, and it's, it's a two way relationship opposed to you just being a teacher and talking at them with loads of information. And I think that's key, isn't it? I mean, I, I, there's one teacher that kind of inspired me at school with my maths teacher. I mean, I, I started off at a really low set and he believed in me and inspired me and then I ended up getting an A for my GCSEs because he gave me that belief and, and it's that rapport you have with him. And every time I looked at him in the corridor, I'd, I'd have that automatic respect for him. And, you know, like it's that relationship. And um, I think obviously you've written a book about it. So, I mean, like how crucial is it to build rapport for the success of these kids? It's everything. Uh, in my opinion, it's absolutely everything. As you just mentioned, you know, perfect example is that is even to this day, you remember that, yeah, uh, you know, sure. what impact that teacher had on, on your life, right? And so that for me is, is the greatest thing. Like I said at the beginning, you know, that teacher who influenced my life, I remember it to this day, it's going to impact me for the rest of my life um, because there was rapport between us. Um, and so I, I believe developing rapport is something that we have to do, but it's something we have to be intentional about. It doesn't just happen. Uh, some people naturally, you know, might connect easier with others, but everyone should be intentional about it. And yeah, look, the book I wrote is sort of a, um, a guide, a practical guide to say, right, how can we actually increase rapport? How can I develop my skills in building rapport with people? Because I do believe it's a skill and something you can work on. Um, and that influences all areas of life. So whether you're in education, you're in business, whatever, the ability to connect with people is going to be the most valuable asset that you can ever ever acquire in your life. Absolutely. What's your book called? Just for everyone to like like to so know. It, it's called The Power of Rapport, um, and it's available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble all over. So yeah, go ahead and get it. And I'd love to hear your feedback on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah, awesome. I mean, look, uh, Mike, we'll leave it there because I know you've got another meeting now. So I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, you, you've been really insightful. You've given us some great information and a lot to take away. Um, and I love your, I love your enthusiasm for education. You know, and this is what like educators are all about. This is like this is what you're doing for the world at the moment. You're, you're doing remarkable things. And for any teachers that are listening, I just want to say a massive thank you for your contribution this year and um, for well. For, for like as long as you've been teaching but i mean in particular this year i mean you guys have you've been heroes so um and mike thanks for coming on like you, you've obviously you've had a remarkable career so i appreciate you taking a bit of time out to to have a conversation with me albeit i had to wake up at 4 30 a.m base all right I, I won't hold that against you <laughs> but, but no i mean awesome i i really appreciate it and the, the teachers in the classroom are the real heroes so uh yeah i, I I, I really appreciate what you're doing in terms of trying to raise a profile and just acknowledge the work of teachers around the world. They, they really are our heroes. So it's been so cool to spend some time with you and chat and hopefully we can do it again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can catch up towards the end of the academic year. See how you've got on. That sounds good. Awesome. Cheers, Mike. I'll leave it there. But yeah, thanks for coming on again. Thanks, TJ.